So I'll be talking about big data. And my main theme here is going to be around problems with big data. And problems can be read as opportunities. Some should be read as warnings. So a lot of this comes from the pragmatic side, not the theoretical side. So a lot of this has to do with real case studies, uh, real issues that you face in, uh, in real companies, big and small. And I'll use several case studies uh, to, make, to make this real. So what matters in the age of analytics is not do you have the data. It's actually can you get the data in the hands of the people who will use it, and does it deliver value to the business, to the organization? Now, that seems obvious to you. We're going to come back to that at the end and ask the same questions and see uh, where we are. So let me start with the first uh, reality check uh, on what's going on in the world of big data. Now, we all know, we all know uh, big data and data scientists, and a lot of the people in the audiences are data scientists, so I'm not going to spend time defining what, what big data is. But it's data that breaks the barriers for uh, classical database systems, both in terms of technology and in terms of representation. The representation breaks when you get into unstructured and semi-structured. And we will talk about this a, a little bit, because there's a lot of hype around unstructured, uh, but there's a lot of good work around unstructured when it comes to text data or documents. Uh, and the reason I like the term data scientist is honestly, if you look at most big data exercises, people aren't really exploiting it. They're doing expeditions over it. So I think the data scientist term is, is uh, apropos because you almost never find what you're looking for, but typically you find stuff that's very useful. Uh, so let's start with what I call classic data, right? So when I was uh, at Yahoo, uh, we had this vector. We called it the Yahoo user DNA. We had something like 3,000 properties per user. And in my time, we had something like 600 million users. So we had 600 million of these vectors. Each is about, you know, call it 3,000 long. That's very classical data. That's not big data. This is very structured, right? Uh, very simple. Uh, the challenge is volume and how to make it work in real time when you only have 50 milliseconds to come up with the right ad, the right person, etc. That Those are a different kind of challenge, but it's not, it's not what I call big data. Now, the argument I'm going to make is almost every big data set, every data set is a big data set. So let's take that same strand and let's look at what happens to it today, right? Uh, so we know where this person, what this person does for a living, right? It says here it, he's a lawyer. Um, there's something called LinkedIn. We can get all sorts of stuff about colleagues, work, uh, notes, people saying stuff about this person. Something called Google, where you can search all sorts of uh, uh, information about the work, the hobbies, the place of living, uh, etc. There's another little thing called Facebook, where you can find um, all sorts of uh, connections, other people, uh, other information, mostly people think on the personal side. An interesting exercise I went through was actually uh, three summers ago, two summers ago, no, three summers ago, I had a couple of interns from France, and I gave them an assignment of, uh, can you find in Facebook a commercial signal? Can you tell me what I'm likely to be interested in commercially from my Facebook profile? Now, Facebook, you know, I joined it back when it started, because I was at Yahoo, and we were thinking of buying the place, and made a few friends, you know, connected to Today, I'm connected to maybe three or 4,000, quote, unquote, friends. I don't know most of them. I made a few likes in my life. I'm not actively using Facebook, but when I tweet, it all shows up on Facebook, and all sorts of people respond, and then they get upset at me because I never respond back, uh, because I don't go on Facebook. So I thought, look, my profile, Shouldn't be able, you shouldn't be able to tell much about me from my profile, you know, from whatever, 10, 20 likes or three likes or whatever I did. Um, yet these guys, these interns, came up with an amazingly accurate commercial profile of me, what I'm, what I'm likely to want to buy in terms of a car, where to travel, what kind of products I might be interested in. 
Any guess as to how they got that information? Come on, question for you guys. LinkedIn? No, no, this is Facebook. Yeah, very good. You cheated, maybe. <laughs> no, it's not my likes, because I didn't make many. But it's my, what my friends, and I say quote unquote friends, because I don't know most of them, right? What they like is extremely indicative of my commercial interests. Now, of course, there's also YouTube Flickr, where you can get many videos, many images relating to this person and or entity. <clears throat> Good old metadata and meta tags and so forth that always get forgotten. And then all sorts of published information on the web. Now, what I've shown you here is a good old boring classical data set. All sources are public, available to everyone, with social graphs, with video, with images, with text, right? And you get a big data set. Today, any data set can become a big data set almost instantly. And that's one theme why you see so many companies overwhelmed and so, so many organizations saying, what can we do with all this data? Because once you put any, even a, a partial list of these sources together, most companies are clueless as to what to do, right? Uh, so the distinction between classic data and big data is fast uh, disappearing. I argue uh, all data sets are big data sets. Uh, and therefore, things like entity extraction and pre-data transformations and so forth become very, very important. Uh, text is the big driver. So the big secret in the industry is, you know, most of the work is around text. Very little is around images and video and other uh, media. Anybody here use Google image search? You know, Google has images tab. Do you think Google understands what's in an image? Yes, no? What do you think? Yes? I hear some yeses. Answer is no. Uh, it actually just looks at either anchor text pointing to an image or the text around an image, which is why often you don't find images of yourself, but you know, it'll think somebody else is you just because you got mentioned near their image, right? Uh, probably the only company that's doing this at scale now is Facebook, is actually experimenting with facial recognition, which is a very highly specialized form of understanding images, to try to recognize faces in images, which makes sense. But to date, I haven't seen really uh, any big um, applications at scale. Chief Data Officer, I wanted to say a couple of words here. Uh, when I was at Yahoo, a week ago, I was actually told that there are 500 Chief Data Officers in, in the world now. I don't know, somebody ran a study. And I sort of laughed a little bit because I, you know, we came up with this title when I joined Yahoo in 2004. They acquired my small company, and we were joking around, and, and uh, Jerry Yang said, you know, what shall we call you? And, you know, Zod, who was the CTO, said, you know, came up with some title, and then Jerry said, well, what about a chief data officer? And we all sort of laughed at the joke, and I said, yeah, that sounds good. Uh, so now it became a, a must-have in many, many companies. Uh, it's really the voice of data at the executive table, and it's changing a lot how companies work. Now, I'm not going to spend much time on this here today, uh, but it's something to think about that many companies either don't have the, right, the chief data officer or the, right, or the right chief data officer, in which case uh, data doesn't get that voice. Uh, but I want, what I wanted to cover on this front is tolerate me for one minute, for I'm about to share with you um, some axioms. I call them Osama's axioms because they're very obvious to me. You may find them obvious or not. Uh, data gains value exponentially when you integrate and coalesce. It loses value when it's fragmented. Hopefully, this is obvious to you, right? If I have data about customers' banking accounts, and I also have in a different database data about their credit card transactions, if I put it together, I get a lot more value. If I separate it, I lose value, right? It's, it's uh, true everywhere. Now, I don't know if you think uh, this, is, this is true in your experience or not. We'll come back to that. If you believe it gains value by putting it together, then fusing data at the source is a lot easier than doing it after the fact, right? Because you spend tons of time and often unsolvable problems trying to put several you know, uh, data, existing data sources together. Axiom 3, standardization is essential. So a customer ID is a customer ID, a product ID. 
a, uh, what are the entities? What are the hierarchies? Are you using the same ones, or are different departments using different hierarchies? In which case, you wind up unable to match a lot of important things. Governance and policy must be centralized and very strong. So if you ever get a standardized data set, how do you stay on it? Recency matters. So data streaming and modeling and scoring has to happen very fast. I know this sounds a little boring, but hold on with me for just two more minutes. Data infrastructure needs constant renewal. So are you separating your data representation from what's underneath, right? How you represent it? Is it dependent on the IBM representation? And when you change to Oracle, something bad happens. And finally, encryption. And do you keep data when it's at rest encrypted? Or is it sitting around uh, inviting problems? And finally, data is a primary competency and not a sideshow, not a support function. Now, I shared with you seven what I call axioms. Do you believe they're obvious? But are they obvious to you, or do you finally disagree with any of them? So here's, here's the part that surprises me. Many people believe these are very obvious. The challenge is there is no company in existence today that I know of that actually even partially satisfies any one of the seven, as obvious as they are. right? And that's part of the reason why data is a big mess. So let's talk about the mess. right? So I'm going to start with the marketing view of the world. Let's say you're a marketer. And you say, I want to use this big data. I want to understand uh, how people, what's the sentiment about my business out there? What do I do? Here's what you do. This is a chart uh, from one of the companies. Uh, th there's another one, for example, uh, the, the LumaScape on marketing technology. And if you want to specialize just on social, there's another social LumaScape. Now, here's the point about this, is not to read it. The point is. It is extremely, it's almost impossible to keep up with what the heck is going on. Every one of these guys claims they're good, and you should use me, and my stuff works. Uh, in the marketing world, nobody really knows what to do, what to use, and what works. So what should users of analytics in the big data world do? So what's happening, right? So the marketers are confused. <clears throat> IBM says, your problems are solved. We will build you a data lake. So what's a data lake? Uh, you have a whole bunch of databases. You load up the data into something like Hadoop. And it all comes together in a very nice and fast way. And you, know, you get quotes like, according to GE, the, the, the data lake made possible some stuff that they thought might take years. They can do it in minutes or days or whatever. But here's what, what happens with a data lake. If you try to get data from a data lake, it's like <laughs> shopping in a flea market. I find an item. Is it real? Is it fake? Where did it come from? Whose hands has it been in? What happened to it? Right? Was it tampered with? Good luck. Good luck finding stuff. So what typically happens is you, you get all these celebrations, and I've been part of them in many companies. We loaded the data. Yay. All sorts of congratulations, emails. And now what? Right? And typically, the now what means 10 million to 100 million, depending on whether you're a bank on the big side or a smaller company got just wasted, because right? they really don't know what to do with it. That's pretty bad. Now, what would you do with, with data like this, by the way? There's a company called Amazon. It deals with one heck of a data lake. It deals with data that comes from millions of merchants, many external, who are trying to sell their own goods. Yet, it does give you a search. It's faceted, so I could quickly find out different aspects of that uh, item. You can get to the details. You can get to user reviews. You can get to information about the quality, price, comparisons, etc. Now, we are very far today with our data lakes from this kind of interface. That is a big open problem for 99.9999% of the companies. So where do the analysts and the data scientists spend all their time? Right? We've got the marketers confused, people who are trying to support analytics, building these data lakes. So here's where we are. You know, we'd like to mine the data up here, and this is where we spend most of our time. Right? You know the story, so I don't have to spend a lot of time on it. It's mostly about finding the data, 
data cleaning, all, all the good, bad stuff. So what do the technology people worry about? The existential question to Hadoop or not to Hadoop, right? Do I uh, get Hadoop going? And you know, Hadoop was built for one purpose uh, in the old days. It was the MapReduce. Can I do parallel thousands of, op you know, millions of operations that are tiny on uh, a highly distributed environment? It was built for companies like Google that had to do a copy of the whole web and count all keywords in all documents every night, every minute, depending on the website. But Hadoop is taking over in the enterprise. And the biggest driver for it, and I was actually involved in Hadoop in the early days because I was at Yahoo when we were putting out Hadoop as a public uh, op, you know, open source project. It's the cost of storage. This is a surprise to me, right? So if you're a big company, it costs you between 20K and 50K a year to put your data in any decent high performance store for terabyte. Hadoop runs about 2K per terabyte. So storage is the biggest, uh, baddest driver of Hadoop in the enterprise. This is a huge wave, by the way. It's happening everywhere, not because of MapReduce, but because storage is cheap. We're going to come back to this in a second. And of course, there's all sorts of, this is a very old slide when life was simple. You know, what do you do with your Hadoop, right? You have the stuff on the right for Hadoop, the stuff on the right, left for SQL and classical analysis. Uh, and now, this, the, the, of course, the stack started growing. So this is still an old stack. So what, what, do, what does the stack look like today? Here we go again, right? Uh, this is the big data landscape. <laughs> all sorts of technologies. Uh, can't keep up with 40, 30% for me. Uh, I, I like these exercises. This was my favorite slide about four years ago. It talked about sort of the relational world versus the non-relational world and the different technologies. Uh, and about two months ago, I decided, let me go and see what does this chart look like today, right? So this is what it looked like about two years ago. And here's what it looks like today. These are all different ways of accessing data. Relational, non-relational, object, non-object, uh, SQL, NoSQL, or not only SQL, or what have you, of all the variety. So if storage was the biggest driver for Hadoop taking over the enterprise, what's the second biggest driver? I'm asking you guys, you're data scientists. So cheaper storage, biggest driver. What's the second? CPU, wrong. Tools? Wrong, I don't know, tools, ambiguous, okay. Instrumentation, Instrumentation. wrong. Speed. Speed, wrong, wrong. <laughs> data scientist. Data scientist. It's actually ETL, or in the world of Hadoop, it's ELT. What is ETL? Extract, transform, and load. Uh, I live in a bank nowadays at Barclays. If I have to access a new data source, a new data source, say, from my mainframe, the counter starts with a company like Ab Initio or... Informatica or IBM data stage at half a million pounds, so that's like $700,000 and up, for me to access my own data set, a new data set, right? Now what's happening is people discovered that ETL, uh, Hadoop, is really good for this stuff. You can actually load data and do acrobatics with it, do a bunch of transformations, and do it fast, speed, and very cheap because it's free. So we're actually, Barclays is part of a collaboration on open source with the Commonwealth Bank of Australia, where we're actually doing this, uh, a, a big library for ETL utilizing Hadoop. Now, the beauty of this, and there's a theme here, is data is coming to Hadoop because of storage. Data is coming to Hadoop via Hadoop because of flexibility. And we're going to get to the third term when we get to analytics. OK. So the real question now is the three Vs of big data, which we're not going to talk about, volume, velocity, and variety, variety being the hardest. Uh, how do you get value out of those, which is why I talk about the four Vs. So can I understand the context and content? Can I understand the, the community sentiment? Can I understand customer intent? OK. Those are the questions we want to try to answer. They typically require things like predictive analytics. Can I guess what somebody is doing, et cetera? And I listed this chart here 
Because the one thing I want you to keep in mind is even though these applications look very different from each other, you can solve all of them with very few algorithms. So the good news is predictive analytics algorithms don't care about the domain as much if you've got the data in a good, in a good shape. By the way, I have application log file analytics at the bottom. What is the biggest public big data company today? A company that makes its living from big data technology. Splunk. And how did Splunk start? Yes, they provided analysis tools for application logs, for IT nerds like myself, right? Stuff that I thought always was like the most boring thing created today the biggest big data company. Probably Cloudera, when it goes IPO, that one will become bigger. Uh, so let's talk about context analysis, understanding context. So here's a question for you. Who is the company we think of at, as best in handling big data? Google, good answer. All right. So Google makes money by understanding context and placing ads. So let's look at this article. Body parts delivered to Michigan home. What ad would you place here? <laughs> UPS. <laughs> now, <clears throat> is this the right ad to show? Is this damaging to the brand? By the way, don't, don't blame the algorithm, because parts, home, delivery, all sorts of stuff in the article about like delivery, right? Uh, here's another one, a little old, but I'll, c I'll come back with a... Uh, violence continues in Greece as rioters firebomb buildings. What ad would you serve here? Insurance. Oh, that would be a good one, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what ad does Google show? <laughs> Win a mini break in gorgeous Greece. Now, I'm not showing... By the way, I get complaints from, from Google all the time, like, it's unfair. You know, these are old examples. We fixed them, Osama, right? Because they always follow, like, my talks. So this one is two months or three months old. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I'm sure by now Google has fixed it. But this is an article about the New York Yankees. And the ad is for what? Yeah. Yankee Candle. Now, Yankee Candle, I, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know if it's appropriate, right? But Yankee Candle is about romantic, put it in the bathroom, you know, all sorts of scents, <laughs> right? has a lot to do with the Yankee. Uh, I work with a company called Netseer, small company, but to show you that the problems are solvable, but they need depth. And by the way, don't take these things as a tax on Google. Google is an amazing company that has done incredible stuff. It's just that all of these are opportunities where you, if you go in depth, you can beat the best in the world, right? So the hierarchy, the concepts in, uh, 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 in Nets here are New York Yankee tickets, New York tickets, New York Yankees, big league, etc. Right? So you can see what the categories will trigger. And these guys build a, tra a category uh, 52 million concepts automatically by doing 2.3 billion relationships between concepts on the web on an ongoing basis. Right? So they help target the ads better. And we don't have time to talk about how this happens. Uh, but you get good stuff, like they'll understand that an article about caffeine is actually a positive article. And therefore, it's OK to show an ad, as opposed to a negative article where you want to avoid it. And I just to take one last hit at Google, uh, nail gun, insanely fast Java. The ad is a real nail gun and power tools. But if you look at the uh, Netseer hierarchy, it says programming in Java, Java development kit, Sun Java, Java programmer, Java virtual. Nowhere in there does it say power tools. All right, I'm going to skip this stuff. Uh, I think we won't have much time to talk about um, the Yahoo case study, but I want to make one point here. So this is my time at Yahoo. When I left Yahoo in 2008, uh, we were doing uh, targeting over um, about 600 million consumers, doing behavioral targeting, where we look at search behavior. We look at, you know, did you browse the Yahoo autos? Did you browse, uh, did you, you know, look at digital cameras? What kind of news are you interested in? All sorts of stuff to build these profiles. And the way it works is that's what creates this, this user DNA, by the way, that I showed you in the beginning. And what you do here is you build these models. And 
we had hundreds of categories. Uh, each category, you build the models, you fine tune them, you score the whole population so that you're ready to respond in real time, and then you target the ads, and you get very nice lifts, right? So here's a car purchase, uh, 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 <coughs> sorry, car pred purchase pred uh, prediction. You know, when somebody's looking for a car, their behavior, you know, they're doing searches, they're going to sites related to cars, so their interest in the car goes up, and the algorithms are saying, hey, hey, this person is all about the car, right? But then something happens. What happens? Yes, you buy the car. So these models need to be aged. So now I'm talking about an area where I challenge most of you, and we used to do this at scale, that very few of you will pay attention to it. How do these models age? When do they age out? How do I replace them? How do they get refreshed? How do they get managed at scale, right? The management of models is a huge, huge deal. But you do get great results. You get uh, not only conversion lifts, this is for mortgages, but you get 600 times uh, conversion lifts, not just click-through lifts of, of plus 100% in this case. Um, I want to skip this one because I want to focus on another. Uh, I was going to talk about Rapid Miner for a second. This is a company I happen to be on their board. But what I wanted to talk about here is not what they do. When they first invited me about two years ago to join their board, I said, like, you know, tools, data mining tools. And they said, no, we've got all these customers. And then today it's 50,000 downloads a month. But at the time, it was 30,000 downloads a month. 30,000 downloads of this software, this is open source, a month. Now, this is not Candy Crusher. This is not a game, right? So to download the software, you must have a problem, a data problem, and you're bothering to download software and figure out how to bring the data together, et cetera. And what I really liked is when they went out and bought a company called Radoop, small company in uh, Budapest, that actually does rapid minor on Hadoop, but the beauty of it is you do drag and drop analytics, then you push a button, and all these analytics, including the data extraction and so forth, will automatically run on Hadoop. I like this because data is going to Hadoop, ETL is going to Hadoop, and the analytics come to Hadoop, as opposed to taking data out, which is a big, huge problem. If we had time, there's a whole other talk I can give. But I wanted to share this one with you. I actually like this one a lot. This is a friend of mine, Joseph Suresh, uh, Sirosh, who left Amazon and went to uh, Microsoft. And he runs the, uh, the machine learning analytics in the cloud division in Microsoft. Uh, he talks about the cow, this connected cow, right? So this is, these are a bunch of cows that are wearing um, these little uh, devices, right? So what are cows doing with devices? Right? Do they need to take 10,000 steps, like me, a day, to stay healthy? Um, it turns out, like I claimed, every company is a big data company. So let's talk about farmers for a second. This is pretty scary stuff. The technology, by the way, is by Fujitsu. So it's a, a little, uh, basically a chip, right, with a, with a transmitter. So what can a dairy farmer do with this data? They can actually detect health issues, believe it or not. And they can improve cattle production by accurate detection of estrus. What's the estrus? Yeah, yeah, that, that's the thing that tells you the cow is ready for that magic moment when uh, she can conceive. So it turns out this is a big problem. And it's a big driver of the economics on a farm. So their current prediction rate, like a farmer could tell half the time that the cow is ready. And <clears throat> that gives you about a 39% pregnancy rate. If you could take it up to 95%, you could take that to 67% pregnancy rate. And that's a 70% improvement in something that actually matters a lot if you're a farmer. But this is hard, right? Uh, estrus lasts only for 12 to 18 hours every 21 days, and it occurs mostly while the farmer is asleep, <laughs> right? So if you're a really diligent farmer and you have a few hundred cows, one algorithm is never sleep, just stay up at night, watch them all, and, and uh, hit them at the right time. 
So ca can the big data uh, help here? Uh, so how can you tell when the time is right? Uh, and this is actually one, one of the, uh, Joseph uses this line, and I love it, because in all my life, I worked, you know, I came out of the AI and machine learning community, artificial intelligence. But this is the first time that AI meets AI for artificial in insemination. Uh, so this is actually happening in real farmers, right? Uh, this setup, it seems like a high-tech setup, but it's a barn, and of course the, the office is a house, right? It's just like some, some computer somewhere that's receiving the data, and it's sending little alerts, hey, cow number so-and-so, and maybe she has a name, is ready for that magic. All right, so how can you use this stuff? It turns out from a big data, and from a data science perspective, the problem isn't too hard. When that cow is ready, during that nighttime period, uh, she starts taking a lot of steps, right? That's why this little thing detects it. Uh, but wait, there's more, right? So it could tell you that 16 hours after this pattern starts is the optimal time. But wait, there's more. If you do it just before the 16 hours, the probable outcome is a female, baby, cow. And if you do it after, the probable outcome is male. Now, this is scary stuff, right? Because, and remember now, who uses this? This is a farmer using this stuff, right? Big data science and Internet of Things, right? Transmitting. Um, so let me show you. Actually, I'm going to skip. We're running out of time. I'll show you just the results here. So these are real numbers from real farms, right? They don't identify which farms here they are. But these are significant outcomes with big numbers attached to them just by doing this prediction without really interfering with how the farmer uh, runs his or her life, right? So I think this is a powerful case study of um, Internet of Things and big data, and mostly data science, because in this case, there's no big data management problem because they don't keep this data around. Now, the real question you have to ask yourself about the data lakes is what happens when you have to keep the data around? And most companies, whether you're a retailer, insurance, definitely a bank, a telco, you have to keep the data around. So these data lakes are actually evil. When you collect that data and you have this too powerful tool that lets you grab the data quickly, uh, you actually create uh, a whole bunch of problems that you don't know how to recover from. So where does this leave us? I started out with what matters in the age of analytics. Where are we today? The new data landscape is changing dramatically via Hadoop. Most of the talent working on data warehousing is irrelevant and becoming totally ineffective. Uh, most companies are struggling with the basics, whether they're in marketing, in data science, in analysis, or in engineering or IT. The real issues are data management and governance and the dearth of talent, which explains why you guys are the highest paid uh, computer scientists in the planet. So my last note here, uh, the big game changer for me is not just being able to do this stuff, but making it easy and intuitive. So in the old days, if you had a car, your car probably broke down. It was tough to start. You had to have a driver. You had to run around and, and make sure uh, you uh, had the right tools uh, so you didn't get stuck somewhere, right? And today, you get in the car. There's no longer even a key let alone a crank, you hit a button, and the newest cars are actually electric, so you don't even uh, have to worry about uh, the internal combustion engine. That's when a technology becomes really powerful, right? When you just hit a button, you don't know what's happening in the background, and it's doing all the magic. In data science and big data, we're extremely, extremely far from, from that state. So with that, I just wanted to end with one quick advertising. If you're interested, we are hiring data scientists at Barclays and big data people and anybody who knows anything about this space. Um, I included some quotes here, and I really want to quote uh, one of my uh, very good friends who's the CEO of Barclay Card US. We have a challenge to quadruple our business here in the US, and that can only be delivered through analytics in marketing risk, fraud, and operations, and Wilmington, Delaware is the undisputed center of the universe. 
So they are passionate. These are business people speaking. Um, in a most recent internal conference at, at uh, Barclays, I was impressed. Philip McHugh, who is the CEO of the business side of the Barclay card, which is the credit card side of the business, we did a welcoming for a, a gathering of anal analysts. And he was standing on this welcoming video with a big sign behind him that he wrote, hand wrote himself. And it said, Hadoop is in the house. Right? to celebrate the fact that we launched Hadoop. Now, this is a business person. This is a CEO of a business. This is not a data scientist. right? So this stuff is actually real uh, and, and, and very big. I have the contact information here if you're interested. Do contact me. And as we mentioned, the, the slides will be available. So we do have a few minutes for questions. So I would love to hear from you. Thank you. So I asked many questions. Yes. Yes. And yet your intern uh, knew exactly or they figured out my commercial profile based on their likes. Yeah, but I mean, those are thousands of people who said you didn't. Yeah, but they are thousands of people out of a billion. So there are, there are a, quite a filtered set, right? I mean, at the end of the day, they're not completely random sample. Uh, okay. And that's the point. That even these distance, no, not just acquaintances, not even you know, acquaintances, are very indicative which is surprising. I don't know what the sign says. Just a couple minutes. That's fine, yeah. Yes, please. What is the biggest challenge I'm facing right now as a CDO? There, there is no biggest challenge, because all the challenges are like my children. I love them all. <laughs> um, but uh, I will tell you, the biggest one Believe it or not, it sounds very boring, is data governance and standardization. Now, Barclays is 140,000 people as a group. So that's a hard problem with lots of legacy, lots of change. Uh, and we're infusing new technology in and trying to revamp how things happen. So that's probably why you know, things like data governance. The second biggest one is just replacing legacy. Right? Corporations deal with something called technical debt. Something you should be thinking about very hard. Every time you deploy something, ask yourself a question. What is the technical debt associated with this thing? Because long after you walk away, that damn box you just built is going to run somewhere with nobody understanding what the blah, blah, blah it's doing. And shit is going to get built on top of it. And other stuff will come around it. And it will get governed. And it will get. So make sure that stuff is. is is good, at least. <laughs> because a lot of it is crap, unfortunately. And that's the biggest challenge, is a lot of these enterprises are filled with encrusted crap that has a lot of stuff around it that hardens it, and it's sitting there, and that's how they survive. And by the way, it works sometimes. And it's very hard to remove because it's so damn cheap. Yeah, please. What's happening is essentially what we want to do is build these data lakes, but in a very managed and governed, governed way. So for me, a lot of the fights I fight at the bank is when we go start a project. Because the technology is so powerful, right? What's the quote from, uh, with, with great power comes great responsibility? So, somebody sometime walked to me and said, that was said by Einstein. I said, no, 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 that was in the Spider-Man movie. So, <laughs> but that power. <laughs> Suddenly, you can just create messes left and right without actually realizing it. So controlling it and making sure that, look, I don't want to put stuff. You know, you, you'll see a lot of people who will tell you, but I love Hadoop because I don't have to tie myself to a schema. right? Well, it's not a schema. It's a data model. What the heck is your data model? Where does the data come from? How do you update it? What happens if you go away on vacation and come back three weeks later and can't even remember what the heck you did? to put this stuff together, and how did it come together, and what transformations got dropped, and all that stuff, right? That's what we need to build carefully, and that's what's going to be the enabler to sort of move from the old to the new, right? It's, the temptation is almost like suck all the data out, put it in a new company, and start from scratch. It's, it's that bad in that world, but you can't do that. You have to somehow balance, balance the two. All right.
Uh, Todd is kicking me out of the room, so th thank you for attending. <laughs>